Timberlane Regional School Board, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I'm confirming that we are utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting. All members of the board have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through this platform, and the public has access to contemporaneously listen. We previously gave notice to the public of the necessary information for accessing the meetings, including how to access the meeting using Zoom or telephonically. Instructions have also been provided on the website of the board at timberlane.net slash zoom TSRB, TRSB. If anybody has a problem, please call 382-6541, extension 3955. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Kat, can you take the roll, please? Kelly Bowes. Uh, present, and there's no one else in the house with me. Brian Boyle. Present. I am alone in the room, and there are other family members in the house. Kim Farah. Present. I'm alone in the house. Stephen Finnegan. Uh, present. Uh, alone in the room. Other people are in the house. Amy Gentile. Present. Alone in the house. Barbara Kishka. Present. Alone in the residence. Sheila Lowe's. I am here, and there are others in the house. Sean O'Neill. I am here, and there's others in the house. Kristen Savage. She, she may not be able to unmute. Just go ahead. Um, Dr. Cochran is here. Is Kaylee Sheffield here? No, Kaylee is not here this evening. Okay. Uh, There's uh, Kristen. It's Kristen. I'm present. I'm alone in the room with other members in the house right now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all um, rise Madam for Chair, I like to I like to point of order. When was this meeting advertised that it would be on Zoom? It's in the posted agenda. It's in the posted agenda, which was what? When was it posted? Because we just found on out. I found on out today that we had a Zoom as a contingency plan here. Um, the you the agenda was posted approximately notice. a week ago. With the Zoom meeting information yes, it on was. it. Okay. Yes, it was. I just don't want to hold it be part of an illegal meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to the Pledge of Allegiance. If you could all rise for the pledge. Brian, you want to lead us to the pledge? I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. America. and to the Republic, the Republic for, for which it stands, stands. One, one nation, nation under, under God, God, indivisible. indivisible. The next portion of the meeting is the approval of the minutes. There, uh, look, looking for a motion to approve the minutes from May 6th. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes from May 6th. Second the motion. Sheila makes the motion. Brian seconds. Is there any discussion? Kat, can you take a roll call? Ms. Bose. Yes. Mr. Boyle. Yes. Dr. Farah. Yes. Mr. Finnegan. Yes. Ms. Gentile. Yes. Mr. Kishka. Yes. Ms. Lowe's. Yes. Mr. O'Neill. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Mrs. Savage. I'm abstaining since I came in late that new meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to delegates and individuals. There's quite a stack of delegates and individuals, which I put somewhere. Uh, I have uh, made the decision that we will have delegates and individuals for 30 minutes and then we will move on to board business 
Then we'll resume delegates and individuals once the board business has been completed. Should we not be able to complete the delegates and individuals by 10 p.m., we will move to a special meeting next week to continue that discussion. That being said, I did see some students who were visibly, um, I, I did see students at the meeting. I know they have school in the morning um, and I do have a list of those students. I'm going to start with those students and then I will move on to um, the staff that I have that I think was given to me in order. So, um, Dean, if you can see if Cece Romano is on and bring her up so that she can speak. Reminder, uh, delegates. I'm not, I'm not seeing a CC Romano. Uh, if she's online, if she can raise her hand, not everybody has descriptive usernames. So wow. I may or may not be able to identify everyone who uh, has been given the opportunity to speak. Okay, well, let me give you a, another name. Elizabeth Amorelli. Uh, I'm not seeing in, in Elizabeth Amorelli connected. Okay. Taylor April. I have a Jessica April uh, connected. Uh, if she is with Taylor, if she can raise her hand, uh, she is actually connecting right now. Jessica, go ahead. Um, I'll remind you that you should be limiting your comments to three minutes and this is not a question and answer. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm actually, she's coming to the car right now. They're, they were all trying to connect and speak. So she's oh. coming to the car right now and she's, um, will say something. So um, if you could just give me one, one second, then she'll, she'll go ahead. She's ready okay. and she's unmuted. Okay. Hello okay, everyone. Hi. I'm, hi, me here. Um, wow. Sorry, my mom's car was on. We're still at the pack. Um, put the car off. Thank you. Okay. Hi. <laughs> my name's Taylor April. I have been in the Timberline District my whole 12 years, but I've been singing and performing forever. As I started out in elementary school, I always was performing, but I never had the full opportunity yet. I perfected to the best of my ability, but there wasn't enough for a little girl who always wanted to be a part of something. Well, I then got to the fifth grade and I was informed from high schoolers in my class that I was talking about middle school and high school that I could sing and dance every day <laughs> in school and high school. Completely uh -huh. Uh, Taylor, you have apparently have dropped out. Uh, there might be a connection. Yeah. As a girl that had so much music in her life, forever it sounded like a dream. I continued performing to the best of leaves. <laughs> As now. Just to hear me now. Yes. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Um, I will start from where I left off. Um, I continue performing to the best of my capabilities until I finally got my shot in the big leagues or the pack. Um, I got into freshman year. And as soon as I heard that there were auditions, I got involved. It was a journey. When I was a freshman, I wasn't groomed to be a professional <laughs> or a respectful performer, but I am now. I learned about confidence, passion, and determination in music. Although I had teachers and faculty to teach me how to be a stronger performer, I have had, and I do, and I will always have the pack to teach me to stay strong and remember what I did for love. I also would love to inform you that we did put on a musical this year, a full scale singing, dancing musical. And how did we do it? Well, there's one answer and that's Mr. D. This pack would not be here without Mr. D and his position. That this is not just a building, it is love and dedication that Mr. D and many, many faculty members have put into this place that we would be sitting in right now today if the meeting was still in person. Please hear me out 
from a young girl who is speaking now to you. Listen to me and all of the future beautiful students to grace this pack as I did with the same passion that has been shown my past four years and hopefully for you tonight, which what I'm saying right now to the best of my ability. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, James Slip. Uh, James should be connected momentarily. He, Hi, I see can him. You hear me? Go ahead, sir. Um, first, I'd like to apologize. The other two members were trying to join, but for technology issues, they should have joined already. Um, my name is James Slip. I am a senior at Timberlane, and I am in band, chorus, and the Timberlane Players. In the fall, I'll be going to college to study music education, and I don't think I would be doing that if I hadn't been part of our music program. There are only so many schools that have equally strong band, chorus, orchestra, and guitar orchestras, a wildly popular improv group, and the opportunity to perform a whopping total of eight plays a year. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. Music has been my passion, what I live and breathe. Only people who have experienced the same passion or have been in the audience to see Timberlane students perform may understand what I'm talking about. Music is a blessing on this earth and inspires hundreds of students throughout Timberlane Middle and High School it has proven to improve academic performance, reduce anxiety and depression, and form meaningful lifelong relationships between peers. It would not be possible, however, without the amazing music teachers we have, and most importantly, the work of a highly qualified PAC director, such as Mr. DeBart Lumeo. Without Mr. D, we wouldn't be one of the best programs in the state. We would just be good. This is an extremely important position. It should be top priority to find a long-term competent replacement who can even begin to compare to Mr. D. Thank you. Thank you. So is Cece Romano now on or Elizabeth Amorelli? If not, I'd like to bring Mrs. McGurk. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Elizabeth Amorelli is connected. Uh, may I bring her on right now? Yes, Dean, please go ahead. She's on. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Hi, could you hear me? Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Elizabeth Amorelli. I'm the president of the Timberlane High School Band, and I would like to speak on behalf of not only myself and the students in band, but the countless number of students that are involved in the music program from elementary school through high school. Through the years, Timberlane's music program has been the model for programs at other schools in the area and throughout New Hampshire, and this is due to the efforts of Mr. DeBartolomeo and the many other teachers in the music department. The music program that Mr. D has worked to form is a place where students feel connected to one another and a place where they can express themselves through any form of music. I'm in the pack every day for a music class or rehearsal, and I know that this is the case for many other students. If it isn't for a class, they're there for a production the players are putting on, a rehearsal for an ensemble group, or simply just to use a practice room for a private lesson or independent practice. In the class of 2021, nine out of the 10 students in the top 10 academically ranked seniors are a part of the music program, whether it be in band, chorus, or orchestra. Additionally, year after year, Timberland sends a large number to each Allstate Festival, oftentimes sending more students than any other school. This just shows how important the music is to students and the correlation between learning to read and play music and one's ability to be proficient in the classroom. Music is important. Not only does Mr. D help to teach and direct the band and other groups at the high school, but he coordinates every production the players puts on and all music concerts and events from elementary to high school. His job is important to the structure of the music program. It will not be enough to just appoint a pre-existing faculty member to the position because they will be overloaded with responsibilities and be unable to teach and work to their best ability in either position. The position of music director needs to be posted in full to allow for the best candidate possible in order to maintain the strength and quality of Timberland's music program and music education. I urge you to reconsider your decisions about the necessity of the music director position at our school and to remind you that not only will this have an effect on the current students in the music program, but it will diminish the quality of music education for students in the future if this position is not filled. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Cece Romano. No, we have, uh, Cece oh, here she comes. Joining us shortly. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we have you. Thank you. Go ahead, Cece. Perfect. 
uh, as the president elect, of course, treasurer of Triumph, a player's leader, and somebody who has been involved with music and theater for my entire life, I would like to say some words. I would not be where I am today without having been given the opportunity to experiment in elementary and middle school. This director position posting includes an elementary, middle, and high school approach. The kids in these younger grades, uh, the kids in these younger grades are the future of the music department here at Timberlane, and elementary school is where it all starts. Our music department has a record of a large amount of students in all states, with a number of those winning best in their state. It is because of the quality work that Mr. D puts in that we can have chamber choirs and chorus and orchestra, that there can be elementary honors choirs and bands, that our band can be involved in special events such as the Dover Band Show, that both of our orchestras can perform so well that there are more than 50 qualified students in the Triumph Music Honor Society, and that the Timberlane players are able to put on upwards of eight productions a year. In 2014, Around this time, there was contemplation over a budget cut in the arts program for elementary schools in the district. And many of the seniors who were here earlier today sat there as fifth graders holding signs in protest for the same thing that they are fighting for seven years later. It is vital that you, the administrators before me, honor the incredible quality of our music department by posting the job listing for the director of the music position immediately in order to ensure that we can locate the best quality candidate. The kids in elementary school, those, will who, uh, those who will be joining the high school in coming years, and all of the students that you saw here today deserve to be given the best opportunities possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next person I would like to bring up, Dean, is uh, Ms. McGurk from Plastow. Board members, in your packet, um, there was a handout for Ms. McGurk. She did request to have this um, be a presentation. I did not think that was appropriate given the limitations on delegates and individuals, um, but I would certainly like her to speak. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. All right, well, thank you for reading my presentation. Uh, my presentation, and thank you for the high school kids that um, so eloquently spoke um, about their experiences and how much this has meant to them. You know, really, I think some people don't realize that in addition to this wonderful experience that we're giving um, these young children and older children uh, through music education is that our Performing Arts Center is not only a place to educate children, it's also a place to bring in our community. And some people don't realize that. So if you look at the orange slide, the historical information, um, we all the way up to going back from 1966 to 1974, we had a music director, um, Stuart Morris. And then in 1976, all the way to 1987, John Giacobbe. Okay, now when Tony came in in 1987, he was the music director, as every, everybody has been mentioning, the music director, district music director until the year 2000. In the year 2000, this beautiful building was built and brought in the community. So in, a, in at that point in time, it really became two jobs. He was not only doing the district, but he was bringing in community and international talent. So if you look at the next slide, the table of contents, it's really an overview of both both of the things that he's been doing that you may or may not have been aware of. If we start with a district music director, you're probably aware of most of his responsibilities. Maybe the community isn't, so I'm gonna rattle them off. Curriculum guidance and evaluation, formal and informal of staff, observations, participation in all classes, six through 12, department budget, leadership meetings, SAU meetings, set staff and student behavior standards and maintain corrective disciplinary measures, parent communication, which obviously we, you know, we, we want to constantly be in contact with our parents. We understand that. Biennial music trips, planning and attendance, Washington DC, Disney, those are huge events that take a lot of planning. Other event planning, elementary, middle, high school concerts, music camps, marching band camps, visiting professors from UNH and other, and other universities around New England, faculty concerts, solo ensemble night, in addition to that, 
We also have the Fall Jazz Spring Band Orchestra Chorus Guitar, New Hampshire Allstate Planning. That is a huge event. And that's probably one of the focal points of the education uh, educators year is trying to get these kids ready for their performances. There's the New Hampshire Music Educators Award um, Association Spring Meeting. There's the aiding the preparation of the students for auditions, transportation to the uh, auditions and attendance. Uh, it's a pretty much a three day, well, two and a half day events. So it takes a lot of work. Next slide. The musical, they put that together so quickly and that was probably, they probably put in about 14, 17 hours a day trying to get that going. Auditions, production, pit conductor for performance. Coordinating and, and also communicating with the Timberline Music Association. That's the parents and the student music program. I mean, uh, association, sorry. Coordinating the PAC event. And this is the part, these are a little tidbits that people don't think about. But this PAC event calendar takes a lot of planning, a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions with other principals. And then of course, you as a school board approve that calendar. Um, maintain safety plans for all staff and students for all emergency situations. All of those fire drills that have to be planned and you know, uh, evacuations, et cetera. Overseeing the audiovisual visual personnel and, and equipment needs. And that is only the director of music's uh, that's just that segment of his responsibilities. Now, if you turn the page, we're looking at a whole separate set of, well, maybe not separate set, but sort of intertwined set of things that is happening behind the scenes that you may not be aware of. Uh, drawing in international music talent for purposes of creating profitable, profitable performances. And that's something we really need to think about if you're trying to cut the position, but I don't think you should, for many, many reasons, but this is one of the big reasons. If you have somebody in there who is able to draw in talent from around the world, really, we've had uh, you know the German choral group uh, come in, the boys, the boys Vienna choir, and those are these are international uh, talent that's coming in. So somebody's got to do that, and they want to coordinate it as opportunities as well for all of our music education students. So it's not just the community that's benefiting from this international talent that's coming into the performing arts sector. All right, we also are creating, oh, he, not us, but he is creating community opportunities for residents, senior night, movie night. Remember we used to do that? And there's also the Veterans Day, and I left out on the table tonight, and I hope that you had a chance to see it, We've had governors come through here. Two governors have come through Kelly, you know, Senator Kelly Ayotte, multiple Congress people. And they're coming in because of Tony. Tony has reached out to these people and said, please come see our Performing Arts Center and help us recognize the veterans in our community. That takes a lot of work. That doesn't happen overnight. That's probably, probably I'd say he's probably spending months doing that, following up, following up, following up, making sure these people are coming. Um, also liaison with the Timberlane Community Music Association, which has been a really beneficial thing for uh, people of all ages. In that group, he's brought in kids as young as uh, 13, 12 years old to play in it. I know my son was about 12 when he started and our oldest member was 83 years old. And he's trying to make those community connections for us. That doesn't happen on a part-time position. All right, he's also trying to oversee the physical plant defects and repairs and communicate with the district facilities manager. He's organizing annual events like local clubs, car shows. We had a big car show here this year. He brought that in, he organized it with all of those people. He and Lynn Mastrakis, they, they put that together and that's a huge event. Um, he's organized the uh, the Christmas concert for the entire community and it's free. This is Miguel, this is Miguel, to be fair, yeah. I, I need you to finish, sorry. Okay, yeah, no worries. All right, um, and then also uh, he's brought in the, um, the community jazz band, choral and guitar and community band festivals. All of these events are, are free. They're, we're trying to, he's trying to uh, make these opportunities for our community. And please don't cut and make it harder for somebody to get all of this done. This is a ginormous task. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, the next 
person I have is, oh, I'm not gonna call this person, I do not have a town. Kevin Doobie, Danville. Uh, I have no Kevin Doobies or any similar names okay. showing up here. Unless uh, they can raise their hand. Nolan Pelletier, Plastow. Nolan will be joining us shortly. Go ahead, Nolan. I see Hello. your hand. Thank you. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to say I'm very disappointed that you moved this meeting. I didn't see a motion to move the meeting. You just moved it, but that's besides the point. And uh, I just want to be clear that you've been stringing us along all year from the very, very beginning till today. I feel like I haven't been represented. It was quite clear to me that when the uh, survey came out and then no mask was not even an option, it wasn't even on your radar. We need to unmask our kids. We need to make the motion to unmask our kids tonight and it needs to pass. And if you're not gonna unmask our kids, you need to let the parents know so we can make informed decisions and we can do what's best for our children. Over this past year, I've seen my daughter's education plummet and you guys seem really fine with it and I'm not. So if you're not gonna let us know what's going on, shame on you. You need to let the parents in your community know what you're gonna do so we can be informed and make our decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to be Deborah Lincoln. I do not currently see uh, Mrs. Lincoln connected at the moment. Okay, Roxanne Larrabee. Uh, I'm not seeing Roxanne either. Uh, if either of these in individuals are connected under a different name, if they could raise their hand. Uh, well, but I'm not seeing any similar names to those individuals. Okay, uh, Melissa Marr. Melissa will be joining us shortly. Go ahead. Good evening, thank you for your time. Many of you know I have two kids who I removed from the district this year. They have one week left of school and they had a great unmasked normal school year without issues. This morning, they both unprompted said they want to come back to Timberlane next year, but they also know I don't wanna send them with masks. But I'm not here tonight to specifically talk about them. I'm here to talk about my three-year-old. He was, I'm sorry. He was enrolled in TLC with an IEP for speech and OT. He, like so many others, needed help, and he didn't get what he needed this past year. Everything went virtual, and if you think virtual is an acceptable option for a two- or three-year-old, then you've never tried to Zoom with them. So essentially, services stopped. My son is amazing. He is sweet, and he is kind, and he has such a huge personality. But he has delays. Early intervention is just that, early, so that later on, issues don't become bigger issues. COVID was a mess, daycares closed. By the skin of our teeth, we were always able to make sure somebody was with him. I cut down work by a day, but we made it work like so many others. By fall, we realized his speech delays were spilling over into other areas. He was getting more frustrated that he couldn't communicate the way he wanted. His interactions with other children started to become more aggressive, but not in a mean way. His sensory seeking issues amplified. And ultimately we had to leave a daycare that we had been on a waiting list for over a year to get into. We sought out private pay help. We had friends step up to help take care of him while we were working as we waited to get him into the TLC program to get the help that he really needed. The evaluation process was interesting. It was all over Zoom and many of the providers were still masked over Zoom. Everyone was very kind. But because my two-year-old, who had never anywhere ever had to wear a mask, including multiple Boston hospitals, he wasn't trained at wearing one long enough, they couldn't bring him in for any evaluations. Eventually, he was granted the speech and OT IEP. However, there's no defined OT plan because in order to address these behaviors, he needs to be around other children so that they will wait until he's with classmates a bit to see what those needs will be. 
Callum has been in and out of Boston since he was a baby seeing doctors from all over. His pediatrician agrees he can't wear a mask and is willing to provide a letter stating such. Moreover, he's three. He should never be in a mask, especially going in for speech therapy. It has been 14 months. 14 months of fighting to get him the help he needs, deserves, and is supposed to be provided. He was eligible May 1st to enter TLC. We delayed. He's eligible for extended school year this summer. There's a Zoom option this summer, so he can't go in. As long as there's a Zoom option, he's not allowed in the building without a mask. If we wait until fall, when we can only hope that there are no masks, he will have been without early intervention services for the state for 18 months. 18 months with so many issues that, that could have been corrected. 18 months that could have made his life and our lives a whole lot easier. It's now been 14 months, and if I'm honest, for his whole life, I've fought to get him what he needs. I would lay down my life for all of my children so that they get everything they need in life. Please understand he is just only one of so many kids that this has happened to, and it isn't right. Unmask our children today. Thank you. Um, David Kiley, Atkinson. David will be joining us shortly. Go ahead, Mr. Kiley. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank Go you. ahead. Dear school board members, my name is David Kiley. I, re I reside in Atkinson with a child in the school system. I would like to provide clear instruction for a motion, acceptance, and a vote to remove the involuntary mask mandate in our schools immediately. Tonight, you, tonight you're hearing from parents about the premise or lack thereof for this policy and the irrefutable data that condemns it. Tonight, you hear from parents that it's about virological ineffectiveness and unethical harms placed on our children, including physical and immuno immunological, social, emotional, stigmatic issues, interference from educational opportunities directly in your scope of responsibility. Forced masking is a violation of our natural rights, of rights of liberty, life, property, without due process. No legislation nor any judicial ruling has been made as constitutionally required under our 14th Amendment, Article 2 of the New Hampshire Constitution, and human rights and equal access statutes under RSA Section 354. Involuntary masking deprives us of our body's integrity, authorizes the personal trespass, assault, harassment of our property, not yours, deprives our offspring of their rights, privileges, and immunities secured and protected by the constitutions and the statutes. CDC and New Hampshire HHS guidance do not supersede the rights of the people, the constitution, nor the statutes. The body of credible scientific evidence in the public domain for many months runs contrary to the recommendations of the CDC, supported by those in your task force and subcommittees. Appealing to higher authority is simply an invalid response. You are not representatives of the CDC, New Hampshire, HHS, TTA, or AFT. You, re you represent the voters of this district. I remind you that you swore an oath under New Hampshire Article 84 to both our U.S. and New Hampshire constitutions. In your capacity as school reps, you are only public servants, nothing more. And you are non-compliant with the mentioned constitutions and statutes that bind you. It is the right of the people in our district to, to pursue happiness. And as elected officials of a government subdivision, when the people no longer have a voice and must accept the will of the school board, you've exceeded the purpose of your creation. The duty of government under Article 3 of the New Hampshire Constitution, it is your duty to protect the rights of the people. And based on your oath, when you refuse that duty, you concede your delegated powers. I remind you that RSA 42.1, when you violate your oath, you shall be dismissed. Not you may, you shall. Finally, your support of forced masking invites claims and financial risk to the taxpayers, to the board, as a group, and as individuals, as well as the school staff and their families. So again, I wanna be very clear. The purpose of my statement is instructive. End the voluntary mask mandate in our schools immediately. Thank you, Mr. Kyle. Kathy Elliott, Atkinson. Uh, Kathy, Miss Elliott. Shortly. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can. Go ahead. Okay, very good. I'm Kathy Elliott from Atkinson, New Hampshire. Uh, 
I uh, worked in the district for 20 years. During that time, um, I worked uh, in the special education department. Um, so I saw the influence that uh, Mr. D had on the school, not only as a music teacher, but also as a major administrator at our school. Uh, he was well respected by all the students and the program that he created is unsurpassed, not only uh, at Timberlane alone, but throughout the state. Um, the program is so important uh, to my family personally. Uh, both of my children uh, went through the program. My daughter was president of the chorus. My son received scholarships um, to college because of his uh, involvement in the music program. He went on uh, and uh, became the principal tubist of the Honolulu Symphony um, and now currently is the director of education and community outreach for the uh, Portland Symphony Orchestra in uh, Portland, Maine. Um, I can't tell you how disappointed I am that this uh, posting was removed and not um, given full consideration uh, by the school board. Um, I don't believe that uh, any of you personally on the school board are really um, understanding perhaps and qualified to realize that um, a conservatory style program like Timberlane has, um, I sh you should be consulting Tony D and um, asking him directly who he feels the best candidate for this position is. Um, because I don't, do any of you on the board have a music background? Um, do you know what it takes to do what he does? Um, I don't really feel as though I need to rehash how valuable um, this program is because the students have all spoken up for it. Um, many parents um, have come out and talked about how valuable it is, not only to the district, but to the community. Um, so I just uh, would like to reiterate, I strongly suggest that you guys um, repost the position um, and take advice from Tony while you have the chance before he is officially retired. Um, he can help you out with this and uh, point you in the right direction to go because this should not be just an interim position for a year. This should be a full-time position. Um, you shouldn't be considering bringing somebody up and not hiring someone in their place. Um, this is an important uh, program at our school. It, um, and that's all I have to say, I guess. It just needs to go um, get more consideration from you guys and it needs to be filled, the position. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Coral Hampy. And then, then I'm going to move on to board business and resume delegates after the board completes their business. Coral will be joining us shortly. And we go ahead, Ms. Hampy. Good evening, Coral Hampy, Danville, CTA president. I have a few points to make tonight. I would like to start with reminding the board that there is still an MOU in place about the safety of our schools until June 30th. I don't know if a motion about masks will be made tonight, but the TTA needs to be consulted with before possible changes are made. It is a contract after all. On the topic of contracts, we have not received ours for the 21-22 school year. Past practice has been to receive them before April vacation. It is now May 20th. This should have been ample time to overcome personnel absences. It is causing a lot of anxiety and the overall lack of communication is not showing effective leadership. Which brings me to my next point. 
the lack of clear direction from the superintendent and school board in regards to the education of our kids is starting to drive away our staff. Does the community know that as of right now, there will be five new principals of seven in the district next year? Is this a start of a mass exodus? Our teachers and staff next? What will become of the high quality education that parents have come to expect? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, before I move on to, sorry, I'm a little, because I was, sorry, I have a lot of papers here in the doorbell. Um, our student rep could not make it tonight, but she did give me her report. This is from Kaylee Sheffield. I will go through it quickly. Um, <clears throat> the high school, the Timberlane players put on their first musical in over a year called The Theory of Relativity. The show was a tremendous success. The seniors got to have their annual toga walk outside on the track. Um, other Timberlane students wore their best Timberlane pride spirit wear and cheered on the seniors as they walked a the track. Honor societies have been hosting their induction ceremonies in which sophomores and juniors got inducted into many societies with different subject groups. Senior proms being held this Saturday outdoors at the high school. The senior class would like to thank the administration, faculty, parents, volunteers, and many others for making this event possible. The student council elected their new officers for the remainder of the year and is looking forward to having some incoming members join them next year. Um, lastly, Timberlane would like to say a huge thank you to their many su pandemic substitute teachers who have been so flexible for the past several months. Timberlane High School thanks these subs for their constant support and willingness to help students. At the middle school, the Tigers athletic teams have been enjoying the nice weather. Spring sports are in full swing. The eighth graders met a former U.S. federal court judge, Joseph LaPlante, who made his annual visit to the middle school to talk about what being a member of a jury really entails. Judge LaPlante ran the students through a simulated jury and picked 12 jurors to serve on a jury, depicting a fictional case in court. The activity was a culmination of students reading and analyzing the classic play, 12 Angry Men. Coming up in early June, seventh graders will have the opportunity to experience wildlife encounters to support their life science studies. And additionally, the middle school is very excited for the upcoming eighth grade team celebrations, which will occur on the evening of June 16th. Sandown North students participated in Readathon, in which over 130 students read for over 36,000 minutes. Mrs. Sudos, sorry about the pronunciation, fourth grade class worked with their librarian, Mrs. Ross, to research re regions. They created dioramas with their families at home based on their research. The fourth graders have had reading buddies with the High School English Honor Society. Um, for the end of their time together, the High Honor Society students are sending Sandown North students pizzas for lunch, and they all greatly enjoyed their time together. Pollard uh, fourth graders had their annual rocket launch day this Wednesday. It's been a Pollard tradition for over 17 years. Each year, Pollard fourth graders build and decorate their own rockets and launch them in the back of the school. Pollard fifth graders will launch their rockets next week since they were unable to launch theirs last spring. This is always an event that Pollard students look forward to while they're at Pollard and still remember long after they leave. Atkinson has been busy. Grades four and five completed the New Hampshire SAS testing and grade three will complete their testing this week. The grade two social studies curriculum focuses on learning about the town we live in. This year, the, the students cannot go to the town locations in Atkinson. So the fabulous grade two team worked with Dean Zanella to create a video called All About Atkinson. And the students will interact with the video and create projects based on what they're learning. The Atkinson staff were spoiled by their PTA staff appreciation week. The PTA provided weeks worth of snacks, delicious catered lunches, yummy breakfast, as well as prize daily prizes and gift baskets. The Academy staff would like to thank these wonderful parents of the PTA and would also like to send a big thank you to the wonderful Atkinson community. In addition, the Academy would like to urge the community to take time to review recent student artwork on the school's website. Their art students have been working hard and would love to showcase their work. TLC has many fun events planned for the end of this year. The Kona Ice Trucks coming on June 4th and Wildlife Encounters on June 10th for all students linking to their recent animal habitat unit. So thank you very much, Kaylee, for putting that together for that us and um, hopefully we'll see you next time. And I do wanna thank the students that were present this evening before we moved remote for your um, 
behavior and professionalism during what was a difficult time. Moving on to the next item of the agenda, um, we are moving on to the school reopening update. This is informational board members in your packet. You have the results of the survey and you have an executive summary on the mask protocol. I'll open up the floor to questions on this. Uh, Barbara, then Sean. I have two questions. Um, one is when does the extended school year start? Can somebody answer that, Dr. Cochran? I'm sorry, what was the question? When does the extended school year, summer school start? I don't have the actual dates. Uh, Director Karnotis, I know you've been involved in some of those conversations. Uh, so I believe is July 7th is a Tuesday. All right, it so starts, it starts right after July 4th, but the Monday I think is the holiday. Um, so it starts that week and it goes through the first week of August. Right. Will we have a chance to possibly um, adjust the mask guidelines before then? Or for summer school? It sounds like we don't have an answer to that question. Could, uh, Kat, could you put that as an action item to discuss at the next board meeting? And then I, my, I have another question, which is what is the, so we have an exception for athletes to go without masks. What's the difference between what athletes are doing and what kids in elementary school on the swings are doing? I, I would really like to see the kids be able to go maskless outside at recess. And I'm just wondering how far we are from that. So it's my understanding that we, we actually do not have an exception to, uh, for athletes to be not wearing masks. Uh, everything that Angelo has given to me about uh, the protocols that he's using for athletes is that the expectation is that athletes are still wearing masks um, for, the, for the season. Um, and I know NHIA has, has come out with the ability for districts to uh, you know, sort of make that determination uh, whether they do without masks. Um, you know, I am not prepared right now to, to, to make that unilateral decision. Uh, you know, if Dr. In other districts, I, I can only speak for other districts, is that the board or the superintendent has made that choice uh, and allowed, you know, following NHIA guidance that it is local control. Um, NHIA guidance does still say, uh, recommend, that masks be worn while actively participating in spring tournaments and require that masks be worn when not actively participating in appropriate distancing cannot be maintained. So the NHA, that is the NHIA stance that is in your board packet in the mask protocol uh, that was released on May 13th. Um, so as of right now, Angelo and the, the athletic department is still having athletes uh, wear masks. Um, like I said, other districts have made that change uh, based upon guidance from the, the board or the superintendent. Mark, it's my understanding that the NHIA voted um, last night or um, to change that to not require, they wanted to go back to what we were doing in the fall, which was to require athletes that are on the sideline to wear masks, but if actively participating in the sport and engaged on the field or in the event to not have to wear a mask. So sideline mask, but not on the field. So that is the new, um, NHIA standard, which is exactly what we did in the fall with all of our fall sports and did it successful, successfully. And now with the heat ramping up and the masks and pollen and everything else, um, I, I think it's something that we should look at because our athletes, what is happening is it's the most restrictive school. So if we go to a school, if our school says that we have to wear masks, then and we go to a school that doesn't require it, both schools have to wear the masks um, or vice versa if we you know, had a different situation. Um, and I just know, speaking on behalf of all of these spring, I shouldn't say all, but the majority of spring athletes that I've been approached by, they are asking for us to return to what we did in the fall, which was masks on the sideline or approaching the game, but not while actively participating. So 
Kristen, we don't have that guidance in running. I talked to Mr. Pedersen right before the meeting. I'm not opposed to moving to that if that's the guidance right now from NHIAA. I would think that if we're going to do that, we either wait till the next board meeting, if that's what it's looking for is guidance from the board, or we, do, we authorize the superintendent to adhere to whatever the current NHIAA guidelines are. Yeah, the season will be over if we wait till the next board meeting. Well, that's why I'm suggesting that that we authorize the, the superintendent to follow whatever the current guidelines are because can we I, can't vote it. I don't have anything in front of me to, to vote I, on. Can I make a motion that we authorize the superintendent to follow whatever the NHIA guidelines are with regard to masks at um, sporting events? Second. Person makes a motion, Barbara seconds. Any further discussion? Kat, could you take a roll call vote on that, please? Can I hear the motion again, please? The, the motion is to authorize the superintendent to um, follow NHI, or for the board to, sorry, go ahead, Kristen, you say it. For the board to authorize the superintendent to make a decision based on what the NHIA guidelines state. Okay, Kat, go ahead. Ms. Bose. Yes. Mr. Boyle. Yes. Dr. Farah. Yes. Mr. Finnegan. Yes. Ms. Gentile. Yes. Ms. Kishka. Yes. Ms. Lowe's. Yes. Ms. O'Neill. Yes. Mrs. Savage. Yes. Okay, motion passes. Any other questions on the reopening update? Yes, I do. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanna get some clarification on this stuff. Um, we have adopted to follow the CDC guidelines and with the most recent CDC guidelines with mask wearing and people that have been vaccinated. Um, how is that going to be implemented in, in our current environment? Sean, did you read the executive summary that Mr. Pedersen put together? Yeah, I did. So what is your question then? is that we should be adopting what the CDC has, has, has recommended, is that people that have been vaccinated do not need to wear a mask in either outdoor environments or indoor environments. All schools should implement and layer prevention strategies and should prioritize universal and correct use of mass and physical distancing as of May 15, 2021, CDC guidance. Where are we going to stand on this come fall? Do you we have just, a question, Sean? I, yeah. it, this, you, I, the question was, where is the guidance? That's the guidance verbatim from the CDC as of May 15th. Any other questions? Dr. Cochran. If I can just uh, answer uh, uh, from what we're, where we are now, Mr. O'Neill. Our expectation in the fall is, is that we will be fully open from, from uh, the first day. Uh, and where our hope is that uh, over the summer, the, the increase in vaccinations that we hope to have and, and the, the, the con if we have continued low and even lower rates, uh, we, we expect to be or hope to be in a, a pretty normal school reopening pattern. Um, what the guidance will be at that point in time, we don't know. Uh, will we be in negotiations for another uh, MOU? We don't know, but it's our sincere hope that we will have, be able to have a, as normal an opening as, mm -hmm. as we can. Um, you know, the fact that the survey results showed that although we, we only had a 56% uh, uh, return on the, on the, the questionnaire, 96% of parents wanted their children in school. And you know that's the goal that we're working towards. It, it is our goal. Will we have options for fully remote? Uh, we do not know. Uh, we don't believe that we're we're going to need uh, because of COVID the same sorts of structures we're in put this year. Uh, for example, if we have parents who want fully remote for their elementary children, uh, we would not expect that we'll have enough based on the survey results that we have now to have a grade four class at four different elementary schools. If it's gonna be a fully online group, we may have to make it not only multi-school, but multi-grade depending on the desire. So it's our hope to, to 
uh, open and as normal of a mode as possible to continue to support uh, parents and students who want fully remote for, for whatever reasons, medical or otherwise, um, that they may want. But, but it's our goal to, to be as close to, to normal as, as we can. And, you know, using the, the guidance we're doing going forward, uh, we're hoping that, that it'll be a very different year. Now, the emergency orders that the governor currently has in place are set to expire at the end of this month, around the 26th to the 28th. I don't know exactly which date it is. All the MOUs and everything that we have on this is all predicated on the emergency, the state of emergency. If that should expire, then what are we going to do? What is going to be the implementation here we're going to have that the next day? If I re recall, the MOU was for the 2021 school year only. Yes, th that was part of it, but I also believe that there was language in there that it only applies during an emergency order. Mm -hmm. I can I can check and and uh, yeah, if we could please check that. on that because if I recall correctly, and I'll admit it if I if I have misspoken here, but there are some language I recall in there relative to the state of emergency in the state of New Hampshire. Okay. Any other questions? All right. This Moving on to the facilities update. We have uh, several updates from facilities. Um, they're working on a, and, uh, capital equipment replacement recommendations. Um, we have uh, an RFP for the replacement installation of seven new HVAC units. Uh, and uh, we're looking to move that project forward. Uh, still, still working on two new HVAC units in Pollard and uh, they need to look at some other things. Um, but uh, the Cipra plates mentioned Pollard will come in at a box, cost at about $95,000. Much of this work has been able to be funded under uh, federal grants that, that we've been able to uh, utilize and continue to try and, and uh, uh, utilize those for uh, that work. Uh, Train continues to work on maintenance and repair work. They're working in the middle of school this, this week. Uh, should finish up this week rather. And I uh, had a conversation with uh, Mr. Fournier today and he expects that they will finish that on time and that they will move to the high school next week. Um, they are providing detailed progress reports uh, week by week. And uh, the work that they're performing includes both before and after pictures so we can verify the work that was done. We're working on in-house uh, LED relamping project the Energy Committee will perform uh, the balance of the LED relamping work in-house due to the low incentives provided by the utility companies. Uh, an award to Northeast Electrical Distributors in the amount of $215,000 has been processed and uh, our electrician begins, expect to begin work during the week of May 24th. Uh, we're still working on the Sea Power Demand Response Project. The agreement has been signed. Uh, meters have been installed by Sea Power. Uh, Mark has sent a Zoom link to staff regarding a presentation by CPower that explains how the program will work. We also received confirmation from Unitel confirming our participation in the program. Uh, we had posted a while back uh, a uh, posting for a new director of plant operations. Uh, we developed the uh, job description and we are expecting to, we have a, a pretty solid group of candidates and we expect to have uh, interviews next week. Uh, and hopefully somebody on board by July 1st in that, in that position of director of plant operations. Uh, the solar energy project, March reviewed the, the solar energy proposal from uh, Revision Energy and reached out to some other districts who are in, in this process and trying to speak with them and coordinate, trying to make sure that we're, we're getting the, the uh, uh, best deal possible. And uh, we're coordinating with them on the development of our RFPs uh, and so on. Um, and that's it for Mr. Fournier and the facilities update. Okay, thank you. Any questions on that? Yeah, I have a question, but I want to, if I could, if I could go back to the CDC here, I'm rereading Mr. Pedersen's email, I mean, a uh, note here, and if I could read it fully. Fully vaccinated people can resume activities without wearing a mask or physically distancing except were required by federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial laws, rules and regulations, including local businesses and workplace guidance that was dated May 13th, 2021. 
So what they're in essence, they're delegating the, their authority back to the school board in this case, but we've already adopted their as the experts in here and giving us guidance and we're gonna take what they have stated. So where, where's it, where, where is this different than what we've already adopted, Dr. Farah? Where in this document are you reading, Sean? What page? I'm, I'm reading Mr. Patterson's uh, documentation that, that you provided. It's executive summary. It's on the very last page, May 19th of 2021. It's the last where, part. Where in the, are you reading off the last page? I'm very after, off the last page. Are our students fully vaccinated? No, no, well, you, now this is the real issue that, that, that we need to get to because Our, that's what you want to do is Dr. Farah is you want to implement a VAX passport and you want to implement that. Sean, where did, <laughs> what, what, where did that, uh, for lack of better word, bizarre notion come from? <laughs> because you're just asking this and now, now you're, no. you're changing the topic. I'm no, reading. No, no, Sean, you just, you just said that, that, that was what I wanted to do. That's my Device. opinion. Of what you want to implement? Sure. Okay, we're we're moving on. Do you have do you have a question other than yes, the fact saying, is we our students are not vaccinated. How do you know that? Because Sean, do, do you're we not, not authorized have to, to give. Eighteen years of old. Doesn't our teachers that have gotten vaccinated shouldn't they have the right to now exercise that right under the CDC guidelines that we've already approved? You're picking and choosing what part of the CDC guidelines you want to implement we without still any input from the board. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Hold on, Sheila, before you go. The board has voted. Sean, do you have a motion that you would like the board to vote on? Yes, I would actually like us to, to adhere to the CDC guidelines and allow people that have been vaccinated do not need to wear the mask anywhere in Timberline properties that we as a board oversee until such time that the CDC guidelines would change. We've already adopted that. This uh, sorry, could you just stop? I want your motion. That is my motion. Kat, could you read back that motion? No, actually I'm looking for a second on that motion. To follow the CDC guidelines that we've already adopted. We're picking and choosing. We're basically saying right now that we're hypocritical. I, I'm sorry, Sean, I'm looking for a second on that motion. Yeah. There being no second, the motion fails. Okay. I think we finished the, Sheila, go ahead. I just wanted to add to that conversation that Sean, we still have an MOU that we need to deal with with the TTA and the TSSU. No, I, I do understand that, and I do. But you can't go ahead and make a motion when you have an agreement in an MOU with the TTA and the TSSU. That says that we're going to follow CDC guidelines, and they have spoken, and just that some people do not want to ad 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 adhere to it because they're going to pick and choose which to part be, of the CDC they want to implement. They have to be notified, talked to, legal counsel, the whole nine yards. Okay, sure. Uh, Thank you. Kelly? Just real quick, because I know it failed, but actually the CDC came out, it's not in Mark's uh, report, but it came out five days ago on the 15th and said that they do recommend that masks continue in school despite their, their latest guidance, uh, because not all K through 12 students are vaccinated. I can get Mark that link if you need it. Thank you. Can I... Mark, Point go ahead. ahead. It, it is in there on May 5th, at the, on the second page of that report. Oh, uh, the CDC operational strategy for K-12 schools through phase prevention from May 15th, 2021. Oh, thank you, sorry uh, about that. If you'll see, CDC recommends schools continue to use current COVID-19 prevention strategies for the 2020-2021 school year. So that, that, that CDC guidance is in there, Kelly, sorry. Apologies, Just I'm so sorry, thank you. make that point. Okay, thank you. Moving on. Any other questions? Moving on then to the SAU 106 organizational chart. Do I, there is a chart in your packet, Dr. Cochran, did you send a, an updated chart? 
No, I forwarded it to you if you could use screen sharing. Oh, the chart that you that's in the board packet. Uh, the pen, the newest version is not in the board packet. There's a slight change to it. So the one that you have, if you can just scroll down, I can let you know. That is the most recent. Okay. So the new org chart has a uh, superintendent, assistant superintendent for special education. We know that our costs for special education are going up significantly. And we've made a significant commitment to that by uh, looking at an org chart with an assistant superintendent for special education. There will be other uh, aspects to that position as well, but oversight will be there. Also uh, have moved forward with a direct, uh, search for a director of special education. We have the existing three coordinator positions. And as you look a little bit further down, the student services coordinator, all of those people would report to uh, the assistant superintendent. Uh, associate principal, assistant principals would uh, report to the, sorry, associate principal and associate principals would reply to the uh, report to the principal. Uh, and if you scroll up a little bit, the executive director of curriculum instruction assessment would uh, supervise and have reports of the director of secondary education, elementary education, director of technology, athletics, and director of music PAC. And the coordinator in uh, coordinator coordinators in, in this case is the uh, secondary coordinators. Uh, we have only listed the uh, professional staff in each of these lines. So admin, uh, non-administrative uh, positions uh, are not included. So that's the the version that is being proposed to the board this evening. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing because I cannot see people when I'm sharing. Are there questions on that proposal? We need to seek a motion to adopt this. Um, I'm sorry. I'm go ahead, Kristen. Go ahead. In looking at the proposal, I'm sorry, I'm trying to now get out of full screen so I can see it again. But um, I mean, when we discussed this before, it seemed like we wanted to kind of spread things out. And we talked about having um, admins, they, they all seem to be under the assistant superintendent. So the, the principal and the associate, is there a benefit to breaking them out and having maybe the principals under the assistant and I'm sorry, under the assistant superintendent and then the associate principals under um, the other director so that if there's conflicts or issues or things that need to be discussed or to have that ability for a principal to discuss their issues with one person, you following what I'm saying? And then to have the associate principals be able to discuss their issues because they might not always be in concert and you might wanna have your own independent voices. Um, an ability to speak without fear of a retaliation or or things of that nature. So I'm just wondering if it makes sense to break that out. In response to your question, I, I would say I think either are uh, can be useful models. I think there's 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 significant merit to uh, what you propose. This was the the one that's proposed was uh, what aligned best with the conversations that we had the last time around. I just didn't want to put too much onto one person either. So that's kind of, that was my thought of. I have that concern as well. Leave the principals under the super, uh, the assistant superintendent, I'm sorry, and move all the associate principals under the other director. I, I think that would just be a better balance. That's all. I don't disagree with that, Kristen. So let's, let's hold that thought before we make a motion because uh, that way we can make it as one motion if, if we're looking to do that, Sheila. I guess my only um, <clears throat> issue with that, Kristen, would be um, the assistant superintendent is not in a union. So this, this outline makes sense to me. I don't know if the policy. executive director of curriculum and instruction is in a union either. I don't um, know if that's part of the bargaining unit. I, that's the question I'm bringing up. I, in, 
in the in the original in the original PLRB uh, sign for the uh, uh, the union, there was an executive director position. The vacant executive director position, I believe, was actually excluded in the request. Um, so that means that wouldn't be an issue then, Sheila. Okay, I'm just. Just wanted to make sure. Dane is checking the the composition of that bargaining unit, but I, I, I that's it's a good point. Brian, um, I guess I'm I'm gonna speak in favor of the proposed org chart. I would think the assistant principals should be directly under principals, and um, if it doesn't work out, I guess superintendent can come back to the board. And if, if the, they feel the position of the assistant superintendent has too many people reporting to them, then address it if, if, if a problem arises. But it just seems to me that you would want your principals over your assistant principals. I'm sorry. They, Kristen? They, they are under them as far as the day-to-day -day operations of their schools and their buildings. This is more just the oversight, I would, right? I mean, as far as who they're going to or who's, who's reviewing them or, or evaluations or things of that nature or who they go to if they have a problem, who do they report to? Who's their, what's their chain of command? So by doing it that way, but also, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is the assistant principals are the ones that are more involved with the actual curriculum and what's going on. So to me, it would make more sense that they would be under the executive director. So it's just that, building that chain of that, command. Good. That's clearly true at the elementary level because 50% of the jobs of the elementary assistant principals is essentially uh, curriculum work. So at the elementary level, uh, I, I would say that uh, the way that job description is, is written would be supportive of that. I don't get that. So you're telling me at the elementary level, if you're an assistant principal, you don't you do not report to the principal. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that half your job is curriculum. But okay. Brian, they're still going to report to the principal. This is just the chain of command on the next level. They're still going to report to their principal within their building. Yeah. But this is that next chain of command moving moving up as far as oversight and involving discussions or evaluations and moving that way. And I just think having everybody under the, the assistant superintendent puts a lot on the assistant superintendent too. And if these other people are involved more with curriculum, I think the director should be the one overseeing them and being the one to evaluate them and have that input. What about, the, what about we move the elementary assistant principals underneath the executive director of curriculum as opposed to the middle and high school? Because I think those are different job responsibilities. I, I don't know. Because we have coordinators in the high school. What if, what if, I mean, it sounds like we, we might need a little more information on this, but what if we just said the principals are under the assistant superintendent and some of the assistant principals or coordinators when we get to that final determination may end up, you know, under the executive director, then let's figure it out what makes sense. I mean, just I, why not just split them? Principals, principals slash associates under assistant and associates under the executive director and figure out the ones that make the most sense. Does that? Yeah. We, I mean, still have, we still have plenty of time before we have to take a final vote on that. I will this, really come back on this if, if it's the will of the board. No, I, th I, think, I think it would make more sense to approve the organizational structure uh, the higher level organizational instru structure and revisit anything below the principal level. Come back to us, take that as an action item. If we, we could approve this without approving the, um, what I'm saying here, let me go back into screen sharing here. Oh, Kim, why, why can't we just approve it with the understanding that we're gonna revisit the issue on the principles I, and where they land? I, yeah, I guess we can do that. I mean, just, I mean, that way, I mean, we agree on everything above there. It's just the, the question of the principles. And I just think if we got more information on that and we put that back on the agenda just to review where the principles and the associate principles 
properly fit, but I think we could agree on our motion to approve everything else. That's fine, we can do it that way. And I was able to look at the original filing of the, uh, with the PELRB and the proposed unit is all district administrators, including principals, assistant principals, excluded from the unit is superintendent, assistant superintendent, business administrator, human resources director, and the executive director of data assessment and accountability. So the executive director position was not petitioned by the union to be in the bargaining unit. They were listed as an exempted position as is the director of special education slash people personnel services. Right. Okay, so Barbara. I just wanted to ask if um, the assistant superintendent, if, if they had all the principals would have more than 12 direct reports. Well, there are, it seems like seven, it. 11. 11. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. They'd have 12 direct reports. Okay. Because 12 is like the magic number from the military organization point of view. Of, you've got too many. All right. Thank you. Well, you got you've got 12. That's a lot. I would have 12 of the principals, but then if you add in all the associate principals. Well, the associate principals go under the principals, no, not. There is only one principal, associate. And that's at the high school. All the others are assistant. All right. So that's why associate principal is in the singular. All right. So is is there a motion to approve the org chart as written um, with the understanding we will revisit the principal associate assistant principal? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Kat, can you take a roll call vote? Who is the second? I have Barbara as the first. Uh, Kristen. Miss Bose. Yes. Mr. Boyle. Yes. Dr. Farah. Yes. Mr. Finnegan. Yes. Ms. Gentile. Yes. Mrs. Kishka. Yes. I am going to abstain on this because I, I, I still think we have an issue with that executive director as far as the union's concerned. So I'm going to abstain because I don't feel good about it. Mr. O'Neill. Yes. Mrs. Savage. Yes. Okay, moving on, policies, first read. Amy, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I, I'm just gonna stop, my, I'm just going to get a drink of water, so go ahead. Did you say me? Oh, well, mm -hmm. who's policies? Oh, Steve is gonna lead us. Oh, Steve, sorry, go ahead, Steve. Oh, I almost got out of it. <laughs> <Yeah. Real close. laughs> All right. Uh, so there are seven policies for first read. Um, uh, the first policy is JI students' right and responsibilities. Um, uh, should I be going through and reading all of these or? No. Okay. Because this is a first read, so Super. we can read through them and then if we have issues, we can go back the next time. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> that was going to be a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so that's on page uh, one of one or two. Um, uh, so <clears throat> I take a look at that one. Um, the second policy uh, is uh, JIA, student due process. Um, third policy is JIC, the student conduct. Uh, the fourth policy is JICD, uh, Student Discipline and Due Process. Uh, the fifth uh, policy is JICD uh, slash R, a Memorandum of Understanding between the Timberlane Regional School District and the Police Department. Uh, the sixth policy is JICI dash R, which is a modification on of weapons expulsion. 
And uh, the seventh policy is CCB, uh, line and staff uh, relations. So uh, yeah, go ahead, Sheila. I just have a question as far as we've been down this uh, JI, JIA, JIC road before. Um, is this language that you're proposing, I see JIA has been repealed, JIC, student conduct, and more importantly, JICD, has this all been recommended to us by the New Hampshire School Board Association? Yes. As yes. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Yeah, Sheila, it has. As written. As written. So, if you go through the end, uh, so JICD, the student conduct one, um, there are some uh, deletions towards the end of that. Um, okay. And so there are, there are what is not in red, obviously, as you know, um, is directly coming and Amy check me here uh, and Jeff as well, um, I believe is coming directly from the New Hampshire School Board Association. And we, and we as a policy committee has not made any changes to the language from the New Hampshire School Board Association. I guess that's what I'm asking. So Mr. Dowd, you have the most continuity in, in this, in leadership in this uh, committee. Can you speak to, to the question about the fidelity to NH, uh, SAA, the original uh, uh, sample policies? Yeah. Yeah. Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> Dr. Cox, you're just trying to bail me out here. I appreciate that. No, I just know that that I've been able to make some of the meetings, but not all. And I went through this, uh, and I, I looked at it. I don't have any problems with the changes. I just well, I wasn't there for for uh, much of the early work on this. Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I, I had a hard time. He's a little uh, sensitive. Hey, Jeff. To the board. Sorry, I had a hard time unmuting there. Uh, as a general proposition, the language is as recommended. I think there Thank there were some minor tweaks, perhaps to our tailor to our district, but as a general okay. proposition, Sheila, these are for. Uh, NHSA recommendation. Okay, that's what I was getting at because I just want to be clear on our tweaks. Um, so all of these policies have come down from the Hampshire School Board Association. Am I correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. I'll make a motion to accept. Um, Neil, could Sorry. I have a question? Sorry, I didn't look up. Go ahead, Barbara. So the weapons expulsion thing is being repealed in total, and I'm having a little trouble understanding what it's supposed to mean in the beginning, you know, in the first place, and then what is it going to be replaced by, if anything? Didn't Nick get replaced? It's covered under a different policy, Barbara. J I C D. Yeah. Okay. All right. Then that's good. Then thank you. Cleans it up a bit. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of reading. It's a lot of reading. And a lot of work. Thank you to the committee. Yeah, for it's a lot. These are a lot. So any, anybody else? Or can I make a motion? Go ahead and make a motion, please. Um, can I make a motion to accept JI, JIA, JIC, JICD, JICDR, J I C I R C C B line and staff relations as a first read. A second. Sheila makes a motion. Steve seconds. Any discussion? Cat. Ms. Booz. Yes. Mr. Boyle. Yes. Dr. Farah. Yes. Mr. Finnegan. Yes. Ms. Gentile. Yes. Mr. Yes. Lose. Yes. Mr. O'Neill. Yes. Savage. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on, next item is school board goals. You should have school board draft goals in your packet. Thank you to those people that helped on this. Sorry. 
Totally deaf that. Are there any questions on those? With this is an action item. Can I make a motion to accept the Timberland Regional School Board goals for the year 2122? Thank you. I'll I'll second. Uh, Barbara seconds. Any discussion? Um, Kat, can you take a roll call vote, please? Opposed? Yes. Mr. Boyle? Yes. Dr. Farah? Yep. Mr. Finnegan? Yes. Ms. Gentile? Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. No, Mr. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I thought you said savage. Savage. Yes. yes. Sorry. Um, school board goes. Okay. Next item on the agenda is the administrator's report. Uh, we have three items. Um, one is the New Hampshire School Boards Association Student Scholarship recipient. And I would like to inform folks that Timberlane Regional High School senior Billy Savage has been awarded a $2,000 scholarship from the New Hampshire School Boards Association. So he's a son awesome. of board, board member Kristen Savage. Scholarships are open to board members' children and grandchildren for the entire South Central region, which is the largest population wise in the in the state. Uh, he, his successful essay was on steps that my local school board can take to promote student achievement. And uh, along with letters of reference. And if we were in person in the pack, I would have for you, Kristen, a package that would include the check for $2,000 and a certificate to William Savage dated May 2021, congratulating him on the essay. And I will make arrangements to get both of these to you. Congratulations to you and Billy. Thank you. Congratulations, Billy. Congratulations. Can you send that essay to us? Yes, I would like, could you send the board members the essay, please? I'm sure he would be more than willing for me to send it to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations to Mr. Savage. Brian, you'll have to come to a lacrosse game and you can give it to him then. How's that sound? Uh, we have a donation from Health Trust for $150 on behalf of the, the uh, to the district from uh, to support the high school's wellness program. Uh, the board does not have to uh, vote on that as it does not uh, exceed the threshold. But we also have a, a, a donation that the board will have to uh, vote on. And at the Tri-State ASBO conference, Timberlane CFO Maria Williams' name was, uh, sorry, Watkins name was drawn for the annual uh, Simmons Smart Infrastructure STEM scholarship. And uh, because of Maria's good luck on behalf of the district, this is a one-time scholarship for $750 for her to award working with high school administration or a scholarship team to a graduating high school senior who plans to continue their education in STEM uh, and I'm looking for board operation to accept this donation of $750 because it uh, comes in higher than the threshold. So made. Second. So made. Yep. Thank you, Maria. Thanks, Maria. Yeah, good job. And thank you, Health Trust. Okay, so there's a motion in a second. I'm a little confused on this scholarship. So Maria got this by the luck of the draw and she's allowed to give it to a STEM student, Maria? Um, yes, yeah, so I participated in the Tri-State um, ASBO conference and my name was drawn for the distribution of this scholarship and the terms in the scholarship are that is to be assigned to a high school student who is pursuing a, wow. a higher education in, in the STEM program, so. Okay, great. We just That's awesome. To, we just have to submit it to the highest school so they can make the determination which student will follow the criteria and then we can get it. But it's exciting to have help for one of our STEM students. I'm happy for that. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Thank you. 
Uh, so, Ken, I think we need a roll call on that. Ms. Booz. Yes. Mr. Boyle. Yes. Dr. Farah. Yes. Mr. Finnegan. Yes. Ms. Gentile. Sorry, yes. Mrs. Kishka. Yes. Ms. Lowe's. Yes. Mr. O'Neill. Yes. Mrs. Savage. Yes. Okay, thank you. Do Dr. Cochran, did you have anything else on administrators? Or are you moving on to personnel? Um, we have, I just want to revisit and clarify for the organizational chart. The organizational chart is that is being voted on is different by one position uh, that is not in the most recent version. And that is instead of two coordinators, there are is only one. So the board will have to vote in public to rift that position if it wants to enact this version of the org chart. I got lost. Is there a person in this position now? Yes. Well, Remember the board reinstated two coordinator positions and there's only one in this org chart. Hang on, sorry, I've got to stop sharing this org chart so I can see people. Sean, did you have a question? Yeah, I mean, what is the recommendation? The, rec the recommendation was the, the structure uh, that is, is there um, with a single coordinator and the riff of the uh, STEM coordinator for the secondary. Okay, so we've already voted on that and it's already been passed. So unless somebody wants to change it. Uh, part of the rationale is that we're making a very significant increase in our obligation to special education uh, with moving with an assistant superintendent of special education. And uh, this would be uh, one of the ways that, that we would at least actually fund that new position. Okay. So, I guess my question is, my question though is if we've approved the organizational structure without that position, then by default, we've removed it. I would agree. Um, from that perspective, the passing of it, I believe would suffice. Worst case scenario, we would, we would have to go back to it. But uh, I believe you're right. In passing the org chart, that would do it. So I apologize in that case. Okay, well, let's leave it as it is. And please, uh, Kat, take an action for the superintendent to confer with council if we do have to make another uh, vote on that because of the RIF. Director O'Gara, did you have, can you call, recall the specific conversations with uh, uh, Attorney O'Shaughnessy? Yes, so um, we are eliminating the position and we wanted to tell to do that in public because we have to be transparent. But if you want the, to know what the plan is and what's going on, we would have to probably bring up names and go in non public. Kelly? I might have missed this. Did you say the position is currently filled? Yes. So do we just tell someone for the first time that they're losing their job? No. Okay. No, nobody's losing a job. Losing a job. Oh, sorry. The, the, their position's being they're riffed. Being, I, I, thought, I thought we had to tell people before we voted that they were being riffed. The, the position can be removed, but that not, doesn't necessarily see, mean that the person is not being moved sure, elsewhere sorry. within let the me, district. Let me change my question. I thought <laughs> my understanding was we had to tell people bef that they were being riffed before we voted. Is that not the case? And that conversation occurred. Okay. I had, the, the person has been notified. Okay. Thank you. That's what I missed. Thank, thank you. No, no. You're, it was not. It was not clear. There's a riff of a position, but not a, a reduction of a person. Let's put it that way. Yeah. 
Okay, so I think that's the rest of the administrator's report. Moving on to personnel. Um, we have two resignations. The first is Michelle Grimm, pre-engineering and math teacher at the high school, um, who uh, recently made the decision to retire after a successful career. Um, and uh, so I would like to, to regretfully uh, ask the board to accept the resignation of, of Michelle. Um, and I'm sure that will be a difficult position to move forward and that she'll be greatly missed. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to accept the resignation of Michelle Grimm with gratitude and appreciation. I second. Um, Kat, can you take a roll call vote on that, please? Opposed? Yes. Mr. Boyle? Yes. Dr. Farah? Yes. Mr. Finnegan? Yes. Dan Peel? Yes. Mrs. Kishka? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Mrs. Savage? Yes. Okay, we have a second resignation. And regrettably, our loss is someone else's gain. We found out today, and I think she found out only very recently, that Principal Megan uh, Coker will be leaving us to take a, a position as a K-8 principal much closer to home. Um, and uh, she shared that information with building administration and staff in the building today. I was able to go over and speak to her about it. She's very thrilled for this opportunity. It aligns uh, with some of her career goals in a lot of ways. And, and I have to say, I've, I've, I've not worked with her for very long, but I've uh, seen the quality of her work, the quality of her thought. Um, you know, the, the, her deep background in, as a classroom teacher informs how she sees schools and teaching and learning. And she has great insights. Uh, you know, she, she has developed uh, a rapport with parents. Uh, she does well in, in all aspects of, of her position. Uh, to, to in any way that I can certainly ascertain. And uh, she's just someone with tremendous potential. And as much as this, this is a significant loss for us, you always want to see good people be successful and move on to the, to the sorts of, of new uh, opportunities uh, that they aspire to. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity for her. And we're going to have some really big shoes to fill. Um, so while it's, it's, it's bittersweet, I have to say, I, I have, uh, there was been enough on there to go with the middle school that I've, I've had, been able to have many, many conversations for this, for, uh, this year. Um, uh, just a, a wonderful educator, a wonderful leader. And, and, uh, it was a privilege to work with him. And you're, you're not off the hook yet because you, you're, you're here till June 30th. So congratulations, Megan. Thank you. I'd like, I'd like to make a motion to accept Megan Kochler's resignation um, reluctantly, but I will make the motion. I do wish you the best of luck, um, and you will sincerely be missed. I would like to go on to second that. And as both Sheila and Dr. Cochran said, it's, it's sad to see Megan go. Um, definitely somebody else's gain, but what an opportunity and I, I wish her the best. I just, good luck to you, Megan, you deserve it. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kalker was my daughter's, one of my daughter's middle school English teachers. And as I read my daughter's engineering paper this evening before she submits it, I, I have her to thank and, and all the, uh, the English teachers that, that she had over the course of the year. So I wish her the best. Um, Kat, can you take a roll call vote on that, please? Oppose. Yes. Boyle. Yes. Dr. Farah. Yes. Mr. Finnegan. Yes. Mr. Peel. Yes. Mrs. Kishka. Yes. 
Miss Lowe's. Yes. Mr. O'Neill. Yes. Mr. Savage. Yes. Okay, thank you. Moving on to nominations. Um, I'm wondering if we should do this in non-public or not. Uh, I'm not sure why we would, why would we do it in a non-public? Okay. Uh, as long as these people are, are have no, no time. Time. No, I, I, I just want to, we don't usually do these in non-public unless there's a, a specific okay. reason that somebody hasn't notified their employer yet. Well, in this case, I think we're in good shape. Okay. Um, the first nomination is uh, the new HR lead generalist reporting to uh, Director O'Gara, and that is Kathy Linton, who will be joining us shortly. She comes from way far away from which school district was that? Nashua. Oh, Nashua, okay. So we're looking forward to having her join us. So I'd like to nominate Kathy for the HR lead generalist position. Okay, does the board wanna do these separately or together? I yeah, think separately would be appropriate. Okay. Okay. So, is there a um, motion to accept um, Kathy Linton? I'll make a motion to accept Kathy Linton as our HR lead generalist. Second. Second. Okay. And just for clarity, is this is this an immediate start or is this a July one start? Um, she is. I think it's a June tenth start. June 10th start. This yep. is an SAU 106 employee, however. It, she certainly will be, just like okay. me. I just, I'm just trying to, for the public, clarifying this. This is, mm -hmm. a, this is staffing up the SAU. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead, Kat. Can you take a roll call on this, please? Ms. Bose. Yes. Mr. Boyle. Yes. Dr. Farah. Yes. Mr. Finnegan. Yes. Ms. Thiel. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Rose. Yes. Romeo. Yes. Savage. Yes. Okay, thank you. And um, Ms. O'Gara, this, this is actually a replacement because we've already lost, we have lost a employee in the SAU, right? HR mm -hmm. department? Yeah. I, I just want to clarify this because I, I know there are members of the public that are counting the cost of the withdrawal this is a replacement for a current SAU employee. Yes. Well, we will be hiring them under SAU 106, given the short time frame that they would have been with SAU 55. Just want to clarify that for the public. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on, the next nomination. The second nomination, it gives me great pleasure to nominate uh, Kelly Brooks, who's currently a coordinator of special education at the high school for the position of the director of special education beginning July 1st, uh, 2021. I'll make a motion to accept Kelly Brooks as the director of special ed. Is there a second? Sean seconds. Any discussion? Okay, can you take a roll call on that, please? Yes. Mr. Boyle. Yes. Dr. Farah. Yes. Finnegan. Yes. 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 Yes after a significant conversation and uh, with, with a, a lot of people in leadership in, in uh, special education throughout the district uh, in conversation with the board about how much we need to increase our capacity and our expertise and our experience in special education leadership. I just received a uh, report from Beth Rincon, who is a former SPED director here and uh, uh, has been able to do some consulting work uh, for us. The, one of the reports that I asked her for was to look at the sort of recent history. The increase in special education costs in the district in the last three to four years, uh, possibly even less, is about uh, one and a half million dollars a year, um, which uh, 
not only is a significant cost, but it also means that you know we need to increase the the, the work that we're doing uh, with our students, try to uh, do a better job with our, our RTI model. Um, but this is something that's that's strategically, both in terms of the quality of education that we want to provide for all of our students, and uh, the the cost savings that will accrue if we are able, if and when we're able to to be able to, to decrease out of district placements and decrease students who, who become identified because of increases in uh, our res response to instruction model, our tier two and our tier, uh, tier three, especially education at tier three, we really have to look at, at, at where we are with our tier two. Um, but Chris has a wealth of experience. He's one of the, the, the best regarded uh, uh, assistant superintendents for special education in, in the, the state. And uh, assuming the, the board approves him, I'm very much looking forward to him occupying this leadership capacity in Timberland. And I would definitely. Oh, go ahead, Sheila. Oh. Go ahead. You can I'd do like it. To, I'd like to make a motion to approve Christopher Callen as the assistant superintendent. Second. So, motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, Kat, can you take a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rose. Yes. Mr. Boyle? Yes. Dr. Farah? Yes. Mr. Finnegan? Yes. Ms. Gentile? Yes. Ms. Mishka? Yes. Ms. Lowe's? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Mrs. Savage? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to committee reports. Um, let's see. And reports of the school board. Kelly, do you have anything? Uh, nope, not since our last meeting. Okay, Sean, Barbara, um, Kristen, uh, Sheila. No. Amy. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Just wondering if you have any report of the school board or a committee report. Nope. Steve. No. Brian? No. Okay, Brian, Brian will be working on the search committee for the new um, uh, director of plan operations. Yes. Did I miss anybody? Uh, me. Um, board, we have been notified by TTA regarding um, the beginning of CBA negotiations for their three-year contract, which will move to the warrant in March. Um, that negotiating team will be Brian Boyle, Sheila Lowe's and Amy Cantone. I did send you an email today regarding that. Um, we still will be negotiating for other CBAs over the course of the year for the other bargaining units. Um, so that's where we stand on that. Um, I did receive correspondence from Attorney O'Shaughnessy regarding the withdrawal. Um, I, I have not, <laughs> I will, I will share that with the board. There's nothing, nothing or shattering about it. We still need to move forward with some of the final matters on the withdrawal. But as, as we speak, I think everything is starting to, to separate. Um, so I think we're in good shape there. Any where other stand, business? Where, where do we stand with all the audits? And because I know that's going to be predicated on us getting to a, you know, negotiation with Hampstead. So where do we stand with those audits? Well, I'll let I'll let Maria update on that. The, the only outstanding, um, well, they're really, <clears throat> they're, there's really only one outstanding uh, long-term liability still existing with, with SAU 55, and that would be um, the medical insurance payments that are made to retirees. The amount varies depending on how many retirees, it's under $10,000 a month, a year, I mean. And we do at some point, we could continue to be billed for that until, until that expires or we can negotiate. Um, I, I'll have to work with the attorney O'Shaughnessy and see how we wanna try to move forward with that and then come back to the board with a proposal. But Maria, where do we stand on, on the audits? Well, yesterday and today we had the auditors in at the SAU uh, finalizing the all the all the sampling and, and the requests that they needed for to complete the 2020 Timberland audit. The SAU 
2020 audit is completed. And hopefully next week we will have Timberlane wrapped up. The SAU audit is completed. As Maria said, we actually had a request by our auditors to have Attorney O'Shaughnessy's firm and um, another firm in addition to the normal firm that uh, SAU is using all uh, issue rep letters. And we just received that letter today from Ater Attorney O'Shaughnessy's firm. So I think SAU is gonna be um, coming up here very, very um, soon in the next uh, several days. So that's the 2020 audit. Correct, yep. It's been done so for a while. So let me ask you a question since we're talking about audits in the final SAU audit. The, the books, the final SAU 55 book will close June 30th, 2021. Correct. Who is going to be responsible for it will be you as the CFO for Hampstead is going to be responsible for the final audit for SAU 55 then? Correct. Okay. And we have, I have uh, Plodzik scheduled to come in, uh, I believe the third week in July. Okay, thanks. So we're, we're, we're already scheduled, which is, okay. which is great. Well, that's good because that's yeah. going to, there, there'll be that unassigned fund balance that will have to be. Is it respectable to, to assume that we are going to get this, that audit that, that would start at, you know, for July, that would be wrapped on up by the end of that, of this calendar year, meaning at December of 2021? I anticipate that that audit would be wrapped up um, much sooner than that. I think that what we really, what you really will want are the, the final, um, the final liabilities in the balance sheet and fund balance to be able to um, understand the position of SAU relative to how it's going to be split up amongst the uh, the two districts. So I anticipate that that'll be we'll have no, we'll have those numbers, those balance sheet numbers, long before the audits wrapped up. I wouldn't say much longer, but you know, it's Sean. You have to remember that there's really no everything be wound down, so it should be a relatively quick audit. It's just a matter of trying to get uh, Plazic to. Uh, get in their schedule to finish it. But I'm told that when they leave from doing field work in July, we should have balances that are final. So that'll be really helpful, I think, between for the two districts to be able to have uh, those at the end of July, those balances to at least work off. I just, yeah, also uh, our, uh, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead, Maria. I was going to say also our lead accountant has digitally, um, cleaning up all the all the accounts and setting up everything to be completely ready for July. So when the auditors start doing the field work, it will be everything will be reconciled. So she has been cleaning out all the intergovernmental accounts and everything for the SAU. Okay. And it's it's at a point that we're I'm even asking Plodzik for a flat fee um, built ahead of time so I can even have that paid uh, before June 30th. So we should be very clean. Okay. Anything else? I do want to go back to delegates. I did promise people. Let me see what's, I still have some in my hand here. Um, Dean, I have Bonnie Bowley from Danville. Is she here? Uh, can you spell that last name, please? B-O-W-L-E-Y. I'm not seeing that name um, connected. Okay, right. what about Jackie Wydola, W-Y-D-O-L-A? I'm not seeing Jackie connected. Mark Sherwood? Uh, yes, he will be on momentarily. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Sherwood. Hang on, you're not unmuted yet. Mr. Sherwood, you need to unmute. There you go. Go ahead. Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Let me just get back to my desk. Uh, I won't extend your evening that much longer than it has been, and I thank you for your time. Uh, and again, thank you for extending the comments until afterwards. Uh, as some of you may know that I, I am a resident of Sandown and early this evening, I had a chance to hear from dozens of our fellow students and alumni of the Timberlane Band. Uh, 
I graduated from Tumulay in 1989 and had the privilege of having the opportunity to be in the band. For me, this was not only uh, establishing a lifelong friendships with others that I played instruments with, but it was an also it also provided an opportunity to travel, perform, and work with others toward a common goal. Common goal. For many Timberlane students, unless they participate in team sports, this will be their only opportunity to gain the comradeship and know the satisfaction of working with a group of others to achieve a common greater goal. And in a time when the workforce is increasingly reliant on individuals to work and collaborate together within a greater team, these skills I think are essential. As I'm certain you know, the, there's been a lot of science behind the participation in music programs that leads to lower dropout rates for our students, higher academic achievements, and you heard some of that earlier, whether it's measured by GPA or tan, standardized test scores, as well as reported higher self-esteem. Tony DeBartolomeo was fortunate to inherit the strongest music program in New Hampshire when he took over. Remarkably, over the last 30 years, he was able to not only maintain, but also build upon this legacy and further enhance Timberlane's reputation for musical excellence beyond what any public high school would have any reasonable expectations of achieving. Our Timberlane music grads are competing at the highest levels around the world. I personally have many friends that I graduated with who have found successful careers due to their experiences and the opportunities Timberlane Music provided them. From playing with some of the world's greatest big bands, traveling around the world, playing with, writing, and writing music for some of the most popular entertainers currently in the world, as well as performing on Broadway and shaping future generations of musicians as professional educators themselves. Though I never earned a living based on my musical talents, uh, thank goodness, I still owe a debt of gratitude to the music department for helping me land my first job after graduation. As it turned out, when I moved to Florida, my hiring manager was originally from Haverhill, Massachusetts, and not having a work record to speak on, uh, we talked about some of our commonalities. And when she learned that I graduated from Timberlane, she asked if I had been in the band. When I responded affirmatively that I had been in the band, uh, she told me that I would fit right into her team and the team that she was building. She was simply in awe of what our school had been able to do, and she had seen us perform, and she, she compared us to what her, the other schools around were able to do, uh, and, and this put me in good stead with her immediately. So I think we have a program here without parallel in the state and perhaps New England for our public schools with a widespread reputation for unsurpassed excellence. And whether you lean to the left or to the right politically, I think we all have to acknowledge that the excellence of our music program, uh, both for its direct as well as indirect benefits on our students and our community uh, are certainly indisputable. On a personal note, I must acknowledge that I actually followed my old, in, in my older brother's footsteps in the music program, uh, and I led the way for my younger brother, uh, who was also a Timberlane music alum. And though I'm the only one of my siblings who no longer plays an instrument, the Timberlane music program left an indelible mark on all of us. It had such a positive experience that both myself and my brothers, all of our children, have either currently or are currently participating in the music program because we see what it did for us and we see what it did for our friends in forming lifelong friendships, but also providing the opportunity for our personal growth, dedication, and leadership opportunities. So uh, unfortunately, uh, as I'm sure you've heard and, and you know everybody's on Facebook, uh, take that for what it's worth. There is some skepticism in, in the community at large regarding the posting, then the unposting, and the reposting with caveats of the district music director's position. And by reposting the open position uh, to only internal candidates, it's seen by some and feared by some as a backdoor method of, of leaving a funded and approved position vacant. Uh, yeah, it's the equivalent of my wife sending me to the grocery store with a list of ingredients for dinner and me simply deciding not to buy all the flour she needs. And when she asked me, you know, hey, did you intentionally do this? You know, why did you do that? Uh, in me responding, well, just take some of the flour from the bread and use it for the cake. I mean, it just, it, it, it causes concern in the community. And for those who are, who are outside of the decision-making, and most of us are, there is a fear that this is an intentional effort to sabotage the music program 
by intentionally understaffing it. That's the concern. Uh, perhaps it's just a communication issue. Uh, so I would encourage you all to please look at the importance and, and talk to the, to the folks in your town that you represent to see what the music program has meant for them, whether or not they ever continued with music a, as a career. Uh, but for, for a lot of kids, and I heard a lot of this this evening before uh, the overall meeting, it is their home. It means everything to them, and it provides them some of the only opportunities that they would have for leadership uh, and for dedication and drive. So I just ask you all to discuss that and, and talk with the folks and perhaps, you know, just let us know exactly what you're all thinking. Thank you very much for your time. I know it's been a long evening for all of you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Kelly Rue, R-U-E, Danville. Um, I have, I'm not seeing a Kelly Rue. Uh, I see two Kellys without a last name. Uh, if uh, that individual is online, if they could raise their hand. Not seeing any response at the moment. Okay, um, let's, the last one I have is John Manella. Oh, John Manella. Oh, come on, Mr. Miller, will be on here. And we've had Laura Hackett had her hand up for a long time too. What? I, I, who's that, Barbara? Laura Hackett has had her hand up for a long time. Okay, I, I was just going with people who had submitted forms. So I don't, I don't, I'm not scrolling through the participants, but. Yeah, I'm not seeing uh, Mr. Manila online at the moment. All right. and. So there's, Dean, there's somebody with their hand up? Yes, so, yes, can you, uh, can you put, Hackett. Okay, can you bring her up on here? I will bring her on. Thank you. Ms. Hackett, could you just unmute, please? Down on the bottom left of your screen, you need to unmute. Maybe she just had her hand up and forgot to put it down. Perhaps. Dean, can you can you unmute? I sent her a request to unmute. Okay, so that pops up on the screen. So maybe she's not there. I do have another account. Uh, it's labeled admin NCST. Uh, they've also have their, they also just raised their hand. Do you want me to put this individual? Yes, on? please, please uh, take that person off and put this person on. Who? Oh, hi. Sorry. Go ahead. Who who is this speaking? Hi, this is Amy Murray. I actually have an admin account because I run a pediatric speech and occupational therapy clinic for about three hundred and fifty kids in the North Shore area. Okay. One of the things. Excuse me. Hold on. Excuse me, can you hold on for one second? Are, are you a, a member of the, the four, are, do you live in one of the four towns in the district? I did live in Atkinson actually, and I was in the band and the color guard. Okay, normally at delegates, we limit it to um, members of the four towns. Okay, well, I was an alumni of Timberlane and lived in Atkinson, New Hampshire. Do you know? but you're not a current resident. I am not a current resident, no. It's up to the board members by show of hands. Let us speak, sure, let us speak. Okay, go ahead. Well, thank you. Let, let's, if, if you wanna let us speak, that's fine. I just wanna make sure we're not setting a precedent for future board meetings mm -hmm. to be letting people from out of town. Cause right now the only out of towners that we let speak are employees. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, she's waited this long if you want to let her speak, but I, I will not vote for out of towners to speak at future board meetings because if not, right, this will this could go on forever. So this one exception uh, for speaking on for speaking on matters that aren't going to occur anyway, like this whole thing. Well, so, then then there are other people that I did not call off this delegate list because they were out of town. I I'm going to have to go back and offer them the same thing. 
then I know and, and I, I feel bad and I, I don't mean to do it that way but we can't we're opening we're opening a door that we're, I think we're gonna like you said you know it's only fair then to then go open it up to everybody else and we've always stayed steadfast to the four towns good point okay Dr. Advise, Cochran I don't advise that we do it okay. it's, okay. it's not a good precedent to set um, I'm Kristen I'm sorry, I think I have the majority of board not, not allowing that, ma'am. So we will have to not allow you to speak. I do appreciate you're an alumni and I thank you for participating and listening. And I'm, I'm sorry, but we're, we're going to stay with our current practice. Okay, is there anything else to come before the board? Do we need a non-public for anything? Dr. Cochran, do we need a non-public or we all set? I believe we're all set. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all the staff members for attending and um, dealing with the situation today and the, the amount of setup that you have. Typically our next meeting will be on Zoom unless there's some change to the government's uh, order. We will probably be on Zoom for the first meeting in, in June. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night.